Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He's like you already know all the lines. Perfect. Well done. <laughs> Well, welcome to Easter uh, here at Edison Lutheran. What a special day this is, and what a beautiful day we have for it. Uh, Very happy to see you all here uh, joining us today. Uh, So uh, the service today, obviously, we're celebrating Easter. We're celebrating Jesus' resurrection from the dead for our sake today. So it's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty important day. Uh, Just a couple of notes about uh, the way the service will go. When we have communion, when the time comes, we'll be communing uh, at a station up front um, for those who want to come forward. And so it'll be, you come forward and you get a piece of bread and there'll be a tray with cups. All of them have grape juice in them and you'll take one of those cups. And so you commune as you go through and then there'll be a little, uh, a box, the acolyte will be holding a box for your empty cup to put that in. Um, And if uh, if you uh, wanted to, not come forward. If coming forward uh, is difficult or uh, not quite comfortable with that yet, there are those uh, prepackaged communion packets that hopefully you got on the way in. If not, uh, we can send an usher around with them if we need. Uh, and you can commune in your, your, uh, in your pew, and that will happen after everybody else has come forward. I'll address those of you who are communing in that way. So that's how that will happen today. The other uh, thing that's exciting, uh, well, lots of things exciting. One of the other things that's exciting about today Uh, is that we uh, get to decorate the front of our sanctuary with tulips. That will happen at the beginning of the service. We also have uh, the choir has prepared a wonderful piece for us uh, this morning. So lots of joy, lots of reasons to celebrate. So to prepare for that, I want to invite you to take a moment, and I know there's been all sorts of busyness on a day like today, especially uh, those of you who are perhaps hosting family or uh, preparing for those sorts of celebrations today to set aside all of the stresses, to set aside all of the worries, all of the things that have uh, gotten you going and going and going without stopping this morning, to take a moment and to just breathe and to prepare to hear what God has for you this morning. I invite you to do that as we listen to our prelude. Do you have a lighter for you? Easter litany on the first page of the bulletin. Maybe it's the second page. Why do you look for the living among the dead? We are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Remember what he told you. We remember his words. 
The Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Jesus is not in the tomb. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And we go. Please stand as we sing our processional hymn. <laughs> Barb, could you play another verse of the, just play another time through that? We have too many flowers. It's a wonderful problem to have. That's all right. <laughs> We're almost here. I'm going to do the greeting from here as these last flowers are being brought forward. Alleluia! 
Christ is risen. He is is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Uh, We'll continue with our hymn of praise, now the feast and celebration. Now the feast and celebration, all the creation sings the joy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, and by his glorious resurrection you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 10. Peter's sermon delivered at the home of Cornelius, a Roman army officer, sums up the essential message of Christianity. Everyone who believes in Jesus, whose life, death, and resurrection fulfilled the words of the prophets, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Begins with verse 34. Peter began to speak to the people. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading is taken from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 5. Paul describes the consequences of the resurrection, including the promise of new life in Christ to a world that has been in bondage to death. He celebrates the destruction of evil and the establishment of God's victorious rule over all. It begins with verse 19. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also 
has also come through a human being. For all of for as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Lord of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. First, the introduction. Evidently expecting to find Jesus' corpse, some of his women followers come to the tomb with embalming spices. After a perplexing encounter with the empty tomb and angelic visitors, the women become the first to proclaim the amazing news of resurrection. And the reading begins. On the first day of the week... At early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, "'Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen.' Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what happened. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. I would like to invite uh, children forward for a children's sermon up to the front here. <laughs> what did you wrong? We haven't seen enough of you today. So, hey, yeah. Are you going to come and be with me? All right. That works. And why don't you just, you can just sit right up here. You can sit on the edge or on the floor. Yeah. That works just fine. Try not to knock any flowers down. All right. Did you want to go with your sisters? Okay. So what do you see that's different up here? What's, what's uh, if you look around, would well, you shout it out? Shout out what you see. <laughs> tulips, what did you say? I heard something. Tulips, I see lots of tulips up here. Anything else that's different up here? Yeah? yeah? There's a bunch of crosses. Bunch of, lots of crosses, and one really big cross right here, right? There's white cloths. And there's white cloths around. Anything else new up here? I think you've named most of it, but maybe you see something. Yeah, it's lots of nice flowers, aren't there? And different kinds of flowers. Yes, one more. Uh, there's, Jesus there's Jesus. He's been there. He's not new. But yeah, <laughs> the rest of this is, is there. That's good. So why do we have all this fancy stuff up here? Who knows what day today is? Just shout it out. Easter! There it is. It's Easter. So we celebrate today that Jesus is raised from the dead. So in our story today, some people went looking for Jesus, didn't they? They went looking for Jesus, and they went the last place they had seen him, which after he had died, they had seen him put in a tomb, kind of like a cave. And they went to find him again, but he was gone. He wasn't there. So if you were to point to Jesus, and you were those women, you'd say, well, where is Jesus? And you'd point, and you'd say, I just don't know. If I was going to ask you to point to Jesus, where would you point? He's immortal. You point, oh, so there's a picture of Jesus there. I see some people pointing up. 
Any other places? Yeah, it's a little bit confusing, isn't it? Because he's not where we thought he was. He is not where he had been before. Because he's immortal. Because he came back to life. That's right. He came back to life. He was raised from the dead. And you know what happened to Jesus when he was raised from the dead? He just started showing up places. He just started appearing to people who didn't even know he was coming. At one time, some of his disciples were in a room together, and the door was closed, and he just showed up in the middle of the room. It's like if Jesus just appeared right here. How surprised would you be? Or there's another story, another time where a couple of them were walking to another town. They were sad because Jesus had died. And this guy was just walking on the road with them, and they started talking to him. And they realized when they got where they were going that it was Jesus the whole time that they were talking to him. Isn't that wild? Jesus is just sort of all over the place. So if you point to Jesus, you can kind of point anywhere, and you might be right. He might just show up there at any time. Like in here. You could even point in here, and he might be in here. But because Jesus is raised from the dead, he's promised to be in a few places in particular. You know where he's promised to be? One of the promises he says is wherever two or three people are gathered, in my name, I am with them. Do you think we have two or three people here? Yeah, that means Jesus is here right now. He promised to be. Well, that's a good question. So let's get our fingers ready to point. So one of the places Jesus promised to be is in communion, which is the bread and wine on the altar. So you could point there. One of the places Jesus has promised to be is in baptism, which is what we use this font for. That's a place you can point. He could appear right there. One of the places Jesus has promised to be is in uh, the words that we speak, the promise that we speak. So you could speak, you could point into your mouth or into somebody else's mouth. Yeah. One of the places Jesus has promised to be is in, among his people, the two or three gathered. So you could point out here, Jesus has promised to be in these places. Jesus has promised to be in so many places, you actually don't have enough fingers to point. Isn't that amazing? I know, and he's in more places than that. Do you know why? But do you know why? Do you know why Jesus has promised to be in all these places? Because Jesus wants to be with us, with you, to forgive our sins and to make it so that we too can live forever with God, just like Jesus lives forever with God. All right, let's pray. So fold your hands and we're going to pray. Dear God, we thank you for raising Jesus from the dead and we thank you for sending him to us again and again. Help us to always know and trust that he has promised to be with us and that he will keep us with him forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up. You can head on back to your spots now. You're not going to be last, are you, Drake? No. Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a beautiful day to celebrate resurrection. What a beautiful day to celebrate the renewal of life, new birth. We see the signs of it all around us. We see the the blooming of the tulips. We see blossoming trees. We see the skies beginning to blue up, putting away some of that winter gloom. We, uh, we see it in uh, the new life that is around us, the, new, the animals who are beginning to calve, who are beginning to have their babies. We hear it in the birds and the songs that are new of, of birds in their nests. We hear signs of resurrection all around us. We see the sun coming up earlier, setting later, the hours of daylight expanding. What a beautiful day, what a beautiful time to celebrate resurrection. Although, we're not here to celebrate resurrection in general. We're not here to just celebrate nice, inspiring ideas of new birth, of new things happening, as wonderful as those are. We're here to celebrate a particular resurrection, the resurrection of the man Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who was buried and on the third day was raised again by the glory of the Father, as we say in our creeds. 
We are here to resurrect, or we are here to celebrate the resurrection of this particular man, of this particular body, which was laid in that tomb and wrapped in those linens. We are here to celebrate that particular miracle which happened on a day nearly 2,000 years ago and in a place more than an ocean away from us. That day, that event, that forever changed the world when Jesus was raised once and for all. You know, sometimes I think we would actually prefer to have the symbols of resurrection. Sometimes I think we actually would prefer the idea of new life, of new birth. We would prefer to have a new way uh, that we could act or live in order to get ourselves back on track when things have pushed us off the rails. Sometimes I think we would prefer the open possibilities, for example, of an empty tomb to the real reality of Jesus resurrected in the flesh. Because the idea of Jesus resurrected in the flesh, that there's not just this idea of resurrection we can imitate, but actually a person with a will of his own who shows up when he wants to and does what he promises to do as he wills it, well, that's a little bit unsettling at times. To think that not only is there resurrection in general, but the resurrection is a person and he's here and he still comes among us and speaks to us, and acts within and around us. And yet, that's what we have. We see how that's unsettling in the story. What do the women do? They go to the tomb. They go to find Jesus. They are upset that Jesus is not there, of course. But when the two men show up, things get worse for them. What do they do? They fall down on their faces. They are terrified when the men show up and, and uh, are suddenly there before them. They know they're in the presence of something they cannot understand or control. It is beyond them. And when the angels send them on their way with their message and get back to the disciples, how do the rest of the disciples respond? They say it's an idle tale, which I think is probably a polite way of putting it, when the women come and tell their story to them. It's just too much to be believed. And yet, the reality of Jesus' resurrection means he keeps coming to show himself to it. Our reading stops kind of early in Luke 24. Luke 24 keeps going for a while. It keeps telling these different events of Jesus showing up for people. I mentioned some of them in the children's sermon. So he walks with these two who are on their way to this village called Emmaus, uh, uh, several miles away from Jerusalem. And they realize finally at the end of this journey that they've been walking with Jesus the whole time. And as soon as they recognize him, he vanishes from their sight. Uh, When they run all the way back uh, to uh, tell everyone what had happened, presumably it was getting kind of late, but they were excited. They run all the way back, these several miles, to tell everyone. And they get there and they find out that Peter also has seen Jesus. We're not told the details of it, but that Jesus has appeared to Peter as well. And then while they're all talking about it, Jesus shows up again. And not just sort of a, a, a spirit of Jesus or an idea of Jesus, But Jesus himself, the one whose body had been in the tomb just 24 hours earlier. I want to read this part from Luke, uh, because I think Luke, beyond uh, all of the other Gospels, really conveys the the humanity, the bodiliness of Jesus here. This is starting in verse 36 of Luke 24. While they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. You can imagine maybe that's the most logical way to interpret this. I mean, how could it be that suddenly here he is in the midst of it? We saw him die. But he said to them, why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. What does he show them? He shows them the hands that were pierced. He shows them the feet that were pierced. He shows them that this is indeed the very same body that was scourged and was crucified. The very same body that was wrapped in linens and placed in a tomb. The very same body who they had been following for three years of their lives. 
touch me and see, he says, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, I love this, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. I love that because Jesus shows up in the midst of them. They don't have any idea how to make sense of this, and he asks for something to eat. Jesus, it turns out, is hungry when he arrives. He's been out walking with people to Emmaus. He's been appearing to Peter. He's had a busy day, and he wants something to eat. And so they give him some fish, and he eats it. Here is Jesus really raised from the dead back in the midst of his disciples. You know, sometimes when we hear these stories, I think we imagine Jesus sort of glowing, right? He's sort of angelic. He's sort of maybe you can see through him a little bit almost. There's like light coming off of him. But the way Luke tells it, Jesus is there in his body. And it looks like a pretty ordinary body, a little worse for wear in parts. But there he is, and he eats, and he talks to them. And I wonder, as, uh, as uh, I hear this story, I wonder, you know, when Jesus ate that fish, did he need a napkin to wipe the grease off his lips? Did his beard have breadcrumbs in it from the bread he broke earlier with those two disciples who were walking to Emmaus? Was there dust clinging to his feet? Did he smell like someone who had just walked all the way to Emmaus? Or did the smells of those linen cloths he was wrapped in still cling to him? When he spoke to them, was there a tear in his eyes? Was he moved at the emotion of this reunion? Did his voice crack a little when he said, peace be with you? I don't know. But I wonder, because this is Jesus really human back from the dead with his body, the same body that was crucified. Now, sure, it's a body that can do things that our bodies can't do. This is a, as far as I know, the, the only one so far resurrected body that is not bound by the laws of death. It's not bound by the laws of, of physics. It can be in more than one place. It can go where it wills. It can show up in a locked room. It can uh, walk with people and have them not recognize it until the very end when Jesus playfully chooses to be seen by them. This is a body that is not like our bodies, and yet it is the same body that Jesus had the whole time, the same body that His mother laid as an infant in a feeding trough when there was no room at the inn. This is Jesus back from the dead. This is not just nice ideas of resurrection in general. This is Jesus of Nazareth, raised from the dead by the glory of His Father, not for his own sake, but for us, for you, so that he too can come to us today, that he too can come and walk among us today and speak to us and forgive us and change us and uh, challenge us and work on us and guide us every step of the way. This is Jesus who, when He ascended, did not abandon us, leave us behind. He did not stop being human, but as we read in Ephesians 4, when He ascended, He also descended. He filled the lower parts of the earth and the heavens. He who descended, Paul writes in Ephesians, is the same one who ascended afar above all things so that He might fill all things, so that He might be all things, so that rather than being only accessible in one place at one time, can you imagine if Jesus was only accessible in one place and one time you had to travel to Jerusalem or something to go see Him? Instead of that, He is now present in all places and at all times in just the ways that He promises. And He has promised that to you, that His resurrection, this unique event in history, is also your resurrection. That you too, by the power of the indestructible life which Christ possesses, will live forever with Him. He has come to make you that promise. 
He has made you that promise uh, through the sacraments, through the words spoken, through song, through Scripture. And He will continue making that promise, giving Himself to you fully and completely, body and soul, so that just as you, He belongs to the Father, so you might belong to Him. And all of us will be reunited on a day much like that first Easter day, a day when death will be no more, when mourning and crying and pain will be no more, and all of us will be rejoicing at the feast together with God. Amen. Let us confess the faith of the church using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this day of resurrection joy, let us offer our prayers for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. Enlivening God, you act among us in surprising ways. We pray for those gripped by fear and anxiety and all who suffer from mental illness. Send your healing presence into places of hunger, pain, illness, and overwhelming sorrow. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sustaining God, your creation abounds with signs of new life and blossoming trees and colorful fields. Provide fertile soil, ample sunlight, and nourishing rain in its time so that our farmers may grow a plentiful harvest. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Surprising God, there is no end to the delights of your gracious gifts. 
Instill in this congregation a sense of joy and wonder as we live under the reign of your mercy. Guide us as we walk the paths you lay out for us so that all our deeds are done in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Resurrecting God, you make us alive in Christ. Thank you for blessing us with faithful witnesses and especially those who now rest in you. Inspire faith in us that we too might witness to those who are yet to come. Unite us all with you in the great resurrection feast to come. Merciful God, receive our prayer. At this time, we also lift before you these people in situations we name, either aloud or in our hearts. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We offer to you these petitions and those we carry in our hearts, trusting in your abundant and ever-present mercy. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. May share a sign of peace with one another. You want to mention y'all? <laughs> We will now receive our morning offering.
Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our treasures, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give the thanks and praise. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and glorious resurrection broke the bonds of sin and death and gave life to all creation. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So as I mentioned at the start, we'll receive communion up front at a station. The ushers will, uh, will dismiss one side first and then we'll swap our station and then the other side will go. Um, if you are communing in your pew uh, and you have one of those uh, packet, the prepackaged communion uh, with you, uh, I will address you after everyone else has come forward. All are welcome to come and receive Jesus Christ truly present as he promises to be with this uh, bread and with this grape juice.
For those of you who are uh, communing in your pew, if you take out that bread and hold it up in front of you, so you know that this word applies to that, this is the body of Christ given for you. You may eat the bread. And likewise with the cup. <laughs> this is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may drink the cup. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace from now unto eternal life. Amen. Amen. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, uh, let's see. So a couple announcements. First, a couple of um, uh, corrections to this. Uh, fellowship time will begin after service next week. It makes it seem like this week. Uh, but there's not coffee hour after service now. That we have the Easter breakfast beforehand. So that will be next week beginning. Um, and then uh, just note there's no Bible study tomorrow evening. And there won't the 25th either. So there's going to be no Monday evening Bible study for the next two Mondays. So tomorrow or the week after. Um, and then last thing I want to say is uh, for those who are reading through the New Testament in uh, eight weeks with us, uh, we're going to have our first meeting for that next Sunday following worship. It'll be in here about, I don't know, noon-ish, uh, around that time. Um, and so if you are already a part of that group, um, then you should have been receiving emails from me over the last several weeks. Um, if you want to be but aren't, let us know, let the church office know, and I'll make sure you're added to that group. Um, but we will be having our first meeting, and we'll discuss uh, whether we want to continue meeting after worship throughout those eight weeks or adjust. Um, but next week's meeting will definitely be at that time. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then the last thing, Sunday school uh, resumes next Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, before worship. So, and that includes confirmation. So um, we will be resuming here in person at 9 a.m., which will be great. We're very excited for that. Any announcements that I'm forgetting that I should have said? No choir on Wednesday. No choir this Wednesday. No choir this Wednesday. All right. In that case, is blessing next? Is that what the bulletin says? What does your bulletin say? Am I supposed to give you a blessing? Yeah. Receive what God has for you, which is a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is 5, let Christians sing. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 5. and serve the risen Lord. Thanks, Jesus.